and the first thing you should do is do your full analysis of the budget you you do in your city as well. Your your budget. Your annual expenditure. Yes. Do it without your Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the science instrumentation and data uh, parallel session. And we'll be kicking off our session with uh, Joshua, who will be telling us about Fourier synthesis imaging to CAT7 response to radio waves via simulation. Okay, so um, since, good afternoon, since I've come here, everyone seems to be talking about um, Meerkat, Meerkat, and SK, the future. So my research is just about where Meerkat started from, started from the precursor with the CAT7 radio telescope. But I'm going to use the principle of Fourier synthesis to talk about how it works to produce images and all that. So my project was supervised by Nanama Brown Kluche, lead author of the IPCC uh, COP26 reports last year, United Nations and the Ghana Atomic Energy Commission with collaboration with the Ghana Space Science and Technology Institute and the Ghana Radio Astronomy Observatory. So a Fourier transformed, the principle I use is a, a periodic or aperiodic signal can be decomposed from one domain into another domain. So a function that we're seeing here, f of t, which is a frequency function, is being converted or de uh, dissolved into another function of time. So that's basically what, what free transform does. It deconvolves or processes functions from one domain to another domain. And so in digital signal processing, which is um, an application 
of the Fourier transform, you take an image which looks like uh, the source, for instance, and then apply Fourier transform to it to give us um, uh, it decomp decompose the image into um, amplitude and phase. So if the source was the person person we just saw, then the telescope actually gives data in phase and amplitude. So uh, for the astronomer to get back the image of the source, he has to take the inverse Fourier transform of what the telescope has given him or her. So that will give you back the image. So the data gotten from the inverse Fourier transform will be converted and um, processed through programming languages. So they are fit file, fit file formats. So to get back what the telescope has actually given. And then when it comes to the astronomy part of it, we have a source that is um, transmitting plane waves, radio waves from the extra galactic to the galactic to atmospheric um, surfaces. So there are a polarization um, sequences through which the signals pass through before it reaches the antenna. And um, Zeneca theorem, which gives you the two dimensional Fourier transform analysis says that uh, these plane waves has to, the, the uh, angular distribution of the intensity intensity of the plane waves will, will give you the visibility. So as you can see, we have a two-dimensional Fourier transform where the intensity distribution of the plane waves coming from the source has given us the visibility. So the, 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 the equation we're seeing right now is the radio interferometer measurement equation. That's back in the, the whole experiment I'm doing. So to the image processing that we did, we took a perceived sky, we created our sky um, mod model, and then we take the Fourier transform of that to give you the true UV plane. But for the Cat 7 radio telescope, it's 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 set seven, so it couldn't it couldn't um, complete the whole sample a true true UV plane. So to to sample the whole sky, we have to convolve the UV sampling with the true sky to give the sample UV pattern. And the inverse Fourier transform of that sample UV pattern is give, giving you the dirty image. So to get back the dirty beam from which you create your source, your source images, you have to take the Fourier transform of the UV sampling, and that gives you the dirty beam as seen. And then we use a, <clears throat> the stimulating digital beam forming for the SK aperture array, uh, which is the Oscar, and then the CASA, which is common astronomical software to process our data. Um, file formats, the interferometer, we created a beam pattern and then the, the images. So these are just components and parts of the software we use. And then the first thing we saw was uh, how the station, one, one antenna looks up above. So when you are up above the, the antenna, how does it look? So we saw the, 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 the first image to your right is how the antenna looks, we, we use the dipole, 80,000 80, 80, 80, dipoles to increase the uh, collective collecting area of the telescope. And then we can see the central, which is the, uh, the receiver to, 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 to the, on the surface. So the spaces are just, are just uh, metals holding the receiver to be able to receive well. And then the intensity distribution shows that along the edges of the telescope, the, the concentration to uh, sensitivity reduces. So any source that is at the uh, side loops of this um, antenna will not be perceived well. And then the sky model came in, we prepared the sky module, right accession declination, and then the polarization parameter, the frequency, this spectral index, we use the major minor axis, and then the radius meters, radio, radius per meter square. So we created three sources. And then from the first simulation, we can see that according to our, um, our intensity distribution, sources that lie outside the, the main beam, are not are not being evaluated or seen well. So the, the the middle or the second source is actually in the force under the main beam of the telescope. So it it shows brighter than the other 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 sources that can be seen over the 
So, and then we came to simulate the CAT7, how it looks like. And this, this shows the, the, the simulation of the antenna the positions of the CAT7, which is the 12 diameter compact structured radio telescope, 200 meters apart, which at right succession of 19 hours, 15 meters. And then declination of minus 74. And then we can see that um, the middle, the middle at the F rotates, it's convulsed with itself at the center as well. So sources that passes through the field of view of the first antenna is being captured, captured by everyone and we convolve it together. So we, we started taking snapshots of um, the images and then for the first snapshot, we saw that um, the image was not, was not redistributed, really but it was like everywhere uh, on, the, on, the simula on the simulation we did. So it was, it was not really discrete because the exposure time was really, really less for 12 hours and six, six hours. But just for one snapshot, the source was not uh, fu fully convolved. So we proceeded to 10 snapshots. That's when the source started looking somehow real. And then um, to 30 snapshots. And then um, for 10 snapshots, we, we, the integration, uh, the damping rate was 4,320. Um, 4, and then the baseline increased to 210. But the first snapshot was just 21, which we, we, we calculated according to the geometric mean. And the 30 snapshots, the damping rate increased 1,440 seconds and 630 base lines were formed and 60. So as, as we keep um, exposing the telescope for a very, very long time and maybe increasing the snapshots, the source was convolved very well through the, uh, the first synthesis uh, we saw. Then to 120, it started looking very well and uh, condensed. So for 120, we saw the baseline increase to 360, uh, 2,520. And then the damping rate was just 360 seconds for 12 hours observation. And so um, the next thing we did was to take a step towards clean our data, but there wasn't much time. So all we did, were able to do was to just the uniform weighting for a different for frequency ranges that we saw. Even though we were using the um, CAT7 uh, data, which which 1,445 megabytes, 1,445 mega, megahertz, uh, cut seven measurement sets. We observe from 1,200 uh, megahertz of frequency to 1,950 megahertz. So for each of these frequencies, we were to find a uniform weighting of how the source looks like. And as we did the uniform weighting, the noise increased. Even though we were able to clean, the noise really increased. And then the source really reduced in size because an increase in frequency should definitely decrease the source uh, resolution. And so what, what, what are we, what's Ghana Radio Astronomy doing in collaboration with the Physics Department um, of the University of Ghana? The, the, Ghana actually has no basis in uh, talking about education wise. Students are not, they don't really know much about space science and astronomy. So currently, after my undergraduate studies, I'm now supervising two students to use machine learning to classify galaxies according to um, augmentation and then uh, convolutional neural networks. And so um, the Ghana Radio Astronomy Observatory also, uh, the 32 meter dish that you are seeing here, has a very poor um, beam, beam uh, primary beam. So we are trying to now, as an undergraduate student, I'm trying to work with them to um, do, um, bring, increase the primary beam from 0 0.09 degree per second to 0 0.3 degree per second. So. That's basically what we are doing right now. And they are more interested in employing uh, machine learning to their data set, which comes in one terabyte per second. So for my conclusion reminds that for every sky brightness, there, there is a visibility function that's its Fourier transform and vice versa. In radio astronomy telescope just measure the Fourier transform of the sky and astronomers take the inverse to produce what the sky actually looks like. Thank you. Joshua, so we'll take questions. We have um, a few minutes for questions, either from the audience here or from online. Yes. 
Um, so if you have a question online, you can just raise your hand and we'll get to you. Um, I don't see any questions yet, so I'll, I'll just ask a question in the meantime. Um, so you mentioned that you were cleaning your data, right? Mm -hmm. Cleaning the data. Yeah, but we didn't finish. Yes, yes, but like what kind of software or pipeline are you using to clean the data? So we can, so, uh -huh. so cleaning the data, we can just um, use uh, um, the CASA, Common Astronomical Software, to do that, but we have to go through a calibration. And they've seen that my, my level of um, expertise has not given me the opportunity to, and the time being time time constrained. I'm just finishing my undergraduate student. Uh, so I didn't finish uh, cleaning the data, but my supervisor is saying that I can do that afterwards. So we will, by this time we are using machine learning to do that, to clean the other species left, to resolve the source. Are there any other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Joshua once again. Okay. Um. So for the second part of our session, we'll have um, three minute recorded talks and we'll have one that would be live so it'll be the three minute talk but it'll be live and i will if the people who recorded the talks are online which most aren't i will allow for question time otherwise you can just send your questions through slack um for the people that would be presenting the uh, recordings so uh we're good to go so for our first recording, we have Yusuf, who will be talking about monitoring the comet's activity with TRAPPIST telescope at Eucomedian um, uh, Observatory. Hello, everyone. My name is Yusuf Muran. I'm a postdoc at Auburn University. Today, I'm going to talk about the activity and composition of comets observed with TRAPPIST telescope, which a project uh, uh, in a collaboration between Cadillac uh, University in Marrakech, Morocco, and University of Liège in Belgium. Comets are among the primitive bodies left over from the formation of the solar system. They were among of the first solid bodies to form in a solar nebula. So these bodies are formed in the outer region of the solar nebula where it was cold enough for volatile ice to condense. They are very interesting because they retain a physical and chemical record of the primordial solar nebula and the process involved in the formation of the, of the solar system and the planets in the solar system. So this, for this reason, comets are a very unique opportunity for us to study the primitive matter that has been stored in a deep freeze for 4.6 billion years ago. So they might be played very uh, a key role in the complex scenario of chemical evolution on our solar system planet, like the Earth, and maybe even bring in some water and organic matter, as we have discovered many organic molecules and the comets successively from from Rosita mission in the last uh, past years. So comets are get active, and this as they are made of gas as as they are made of ice and dust. So they get uh, active when they get closer to the sun, when this ice sublimates and this gas dejected. So the gas is uh, uh, ionized by the photoionization effects from the solar radiation. And then we get a tail called ion tail, which contains basically CO plus and H3 O plus ions. And also we have another tail that appear when the comet gets much closer to the sun, which is dust tail, which is made by uh, a, a interaction between the solar wind and also this uh, by, by the interaction between the solar wind and the surface of the nucleus where we get this greens ejected from the uh, uh, the dust greens ejected from the nucleus and forming the dust tail. And this is where we can observe uh, the comet with TRAPPIST. So TRAPPIST is for transition planet and planetesimal small telescope. It's a, a small robotic telescopes made of uh, detection and characterization of exoplanets and observing the small bodies of the solar system, including comets and asteroids. So the first telescope was installed in La Silla in 2010, uh, and the second telescope was installed 
in 2016 at Camden Observatory. So both telescopes are equipped with what we call the neuroband filters. So this is our neuroband filters can isolate the emission uh, of some gas element like OH, NH, CN, and so on, and also some dust continuum and ions like CO plus and H3O plus that we can observe in the tail of the ions. Uh, uh, in addition to some neuro subroband filters, BVRI filter that are equipped with both telescopes. So here is a set of images that we uh, observed with the uh, TRAPPIST uh, for Comet 46P in 2018. So here we have the gas images and dust images and also this broadband dust filter images. So what we can do with TRAPPIST, for example, exactly for comet observation. So as we have both telescopes in the front hemisphere, so we can cover the whole sky from the northern and from the uh, southern hemisphere. So we observe a comet with a magnitude brighter than 12, and we have 50% of time of TRAPPIST dedicated for small body projects, including comet and asteroid. So with that, we can do a long monitoring of the activity and composition of comets and see how this evolution, this uh, activity evolved with the heliocentric distance and also looking at the composition of the comet and your chemical classification. We can also find the link between the daughter and pattern and parent molecules in the coma and study the coma morphology and monitoring some comets in outbursts. So here is a statistic that we have got from TRAPPIST between 2017 and 2020. So we observed more than 25 comets in total. 17 of them are Jupiter family comets, 16 are long period comets, one is Halley comet, and one is interstellar comet Borisov, which we observed most in the last, uh, uh, in 2019. So we got more than 380 nights with TRAPPIST out and 605 nights with TRAPPIST not during this period. So one of them, I'm just going to highlight one of the results that we got from TRAPPIST. First is the change of rotation period of Comet 40P during 2017 apparition. As you can see here in this plot, the rotation period and here the time to period. So you see this change in the rotation period of the comet. So this plot is from Dennis et al. Nature paper with TRAPPIST, we fill out this uh, this graph with this two point they are missing right there, and we confirm the change of the rotation of comet 41P uh, during that period. So this is because due to some activities going on, one of the part of the comet making the comet rotate slowly in the opposite direction, and then changing by at least 25 uh, hour, uh, hours in just two months. With TRAPPIST, we can do a long monitoring and see the evolution of the uh, prediction rate of different molecules with the time. Here is an example of Comet 46P observed in the period of 2018-2019. So here, uh, a plot of the evolution of different uh, molecules with TRAPPIST North and TRAPPIST South for this uh, comet, and we are preparing this work for a publication soon. So with TRAPPIST, as we have uh, a time there, so and we have two uh, telescopes, we can also look at the rotation period of the comet and trying to spend a lot of time uh, observing comet during whole night with both TRAPPIST uh, successfully, and then we use to uh, measure the rotation period for some comets, 41P, and this is an example for comet 46P that we observed in 2018 and 2019. So we did not find any change of the rotation period for, for 46P while we found the uh, change rotation period in Comet 41P. So another interesting thing that we can do with uh, TRAPPIST is to look at the comet taxonomy by observing a lot of comets. For example, I'm showing that the data that we collected with TRAPPIST during that period of May PhD. So uh, we found that you have some depleted comets, which means that the comet they have poor in carbon. So I talk about, I mean, a C2 and C3. And this is just present one third of, uh, of this comet are long period comets, while the 65% of them are Jupiter family comets. Many hypotheses have been proposed to explain these differences in the in the in the composition of the comet. One of them, if this comet have uh, a protein composition or some evolution process happen on their surface when they are uh, orbiting around the sun for many years. So with TRAPPIST, we find three Jupiter family comets are depleted in C2 and C3, so which present 10% of our sample, and we did not find any long period comet that depleted in the carbon chain elements. The same their conclusion we reached with trappies so uh sorry if i'm if i get long on that and thank you very much for this conference um
Um, I do not see Yusuf online. So we will move on to the next recorded talk, which is by Abu Bakar and uh, talking about a study of the light curve photometry of some main belt asteroids. My name is Idris Abubakar Sani, presenting the work titled, The Study of the Light Curve Photometry of Some Main Belt Asteroids. This is my presentation outline. Introduction, asteroids are rocky metallic bodies that orbit the sun. They are made from different kinds of rocks and metals with the metals being mostly nickel and iron. They are sometimes called minor planets, but they are much, much smaller than planets or moons. Introduction to light curve photometry. One of 2006 defined light curve photometry as the process of measuring the variation in the brightness of an object over time for the purpose of plotting and analyzing the data. Introduction to light curve photometry. Researchers make use of light curve photometry in order to determine rotational period, amplitude, polar orientation, and shape of asteroids. The objective of this work is to determine the, rot the rotational period of asteroid 1637 swing, 8693 Matsuki, and 10160 Totoro. This information are, some of this information have not been published yet, and we are hoping to provide this information so that the light curve database can be further enriched. Method of data collection and analysis. The images for this work were obtained from Stain Edge Observatory. Then asteroid and comparison star brightness was extracted using differential aperture photometry with the help of the minor planet observer called MPO Canopus. Then photometric data over extended period of time was compiled to produce asteroid light curve. And then analysis to estimate light curve period and amplitude were carried out. Below are the various stages of processing and analysis of the various asteroids. Result, asteroid 1637 swing gave an estimated period of 10.226 plus or minus 0.009 hour with an amplitude of 0.25. 8693 Masuki gave an estimated period of 5.330 plus or minus 0.09 hours with an amplitude of 0.51. 10160 Totoro gave an estimated period of 6.71 plus or minus 0.01 with an amplitude of 0.29. Summary and conclusion. At the end of this work, we were able to obtain three light curves for the three different asteroids. And we were also able to determine the rotational period of the three different asteroids that we study. This rotational period will enhance the, the knowledge of the rotational characteristics of these asteroids in order to learn their impact history. Thank you. Um, I also don't see Abubakar A online. So we'll move on to the next talk, which is live. And it will be by Alimir. Uh, on a search for a period change of AHB stars. Uh, thank you, the chair. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't make it record because I'm here with you. So my title is Search for Period of Change of uh, Above Horizontal uh, Branch uh, Stars. As you know, variable stars are stars that change its brightness with, uh, over time, uh, either with geometric or uh, physical process. Here I'm focusing on the physical process, which uh, kind of intrinsic variables. Among this, uh, I, I took on pulsating stars, uh, specifically on Cepheid Type 2. <laughs> so which, the Type 2 Cepheid is located on an uh, instability strip uh, <coughs> below. They are below the classical Cepheid and above the RR layer. They are old uh, and low mass star. 
uh, usually found in the global in the global cluster in the hollow uh, in the village of Milky Way as well as in the uh, in the in the small and high Magellanic clouds. So depending on their period, we can classify as Bell Hercules, uh, W Virgin, and RV. Uh, so the, now my focus is on Bell Hercules, which is usually called as uh, uh, the above horizontal plan or HB star. So my main objective is to look for period change of these uh, variable stars. So I, we use the normal general emitters, the O minus C diagram, to calculate the period changes. Uh, as we know that the variable stars have assumed to have uh, constant uh, periods, uh, uh, cyclic periods, but sometimes there is average change of this period. So I'm looking for that period. The period could be increasing, decreasing, or fluctuating. Uh, so my source of data that I used, I used from the general catalog of variable stars. I selected those who are below three uh, days, one up to three days, and I use the existing data sources. Which, which ranges around 100 years uh, period of time. And I took the uh, photographic data and CD data and photoelectric and visual from different sources, like uh, especially from uh, the Harvard, Dash is now uh, on the way to be uh, translated. So uh, I used the different step of O minus C to calculate the residual. I use the uh, Herzsprung and uh, Lombard cone method. So these are the results among these eight, uh, stars, HB stars, I found five, five of them show increasing period while the three of them show the decreasing period with the rate of change around 10 raised to minus 5 up to 10 raised to minus 8 days per year. And for the first time, the XXVR and BFSR are found to be changing in period. Before that, uh, by the Delta, uh, it, it has been known that they never changed it, but from this 100 years survey, uh, we have we have assured that their period is changing. So uh, the, our our results shows the parabolic evolutionary trend for these uh, eight stars. That's what I want to conclude. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have time for a quick question. Any questions from the audience or from online? I am, uh, okay. I came a bit late, so I strolled in to see some beautiful plots uh, towards the end of the day. Um, I just wish I can have some understanding of those plots. They look amazing. Are, they, are those results from using data from the observatory? Uh, yeah, uh, not from the observatory. It is. Uh, already found existing data from okay. the old photometric data, usually from Harvard data. Okay. Because I need a hundred years long period of time. It's not mm -hmm. I don't I don't exactly need the recent one, but the older one to okay. see the, the change in the period. Yeah. Okay. So do you hope that with more volume of data, these results could change? And do you expect the variation result when you have more data? Uh, more old data. The the, oh, le the latest, the oldest one is in 1896 or something. I, I found it from Serban Astronomical Institute in Moscow. Yeah, just a quick question. You didn't give us, possibly, I uh, didn't pay attention, the rationale. Why are you standing the above horizontal range stars uh, relatively to the other kind of stars? What is the importance of those AHB stars? Uh, actually, uh, uh, variable stars, when they reach to instability region, they will change uh, evolutionary. So that's my, my main object, my main reason. Otherwise, I couldn't see that. Because the period change will tell us about the, how to probe the interior of the stars and their evolutions and the structure. So that's my specific uh, reason why I studied that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we move on to the next talk, uh, which is by Doris, recorded, and it's uh, GAI, <laughs> oh, Gaia and Kepler observations of NGC 6811. 
everyone. I'm Atino Darius Ego, a master student from Busitema University in Uganda. My topic of presentation is Gaia and Kepler observations of NGC 6811. Gaia is a satellite that is part of the European Space Agency Science Program that provides five astrometric parameters, including proper motion and parallax. Kepler is a satellite that was launched by the National Aeronautic and Space Administration to observe stars and identify planets. NGC means New General Catalog. NGC 6811 is one of the four open clusters located in the Kepler field of view. Kepler satellite observed only bright stars in the range of magnitude 6 to 18, while Gaia observed both bright and faint stars in the range of magnitude 6 to 20. Thus, faint stars were left out by Kepler satellite in this cluster were observed by Gaia satellite using Gaia second data release. Some of these faint stars have been identified as cluster members. In this study, my main focus is on identifying delta squitty stars that are members of NGC 6811. Five single member delta squitty stars, which were previously classified as non members, have been reclassified as members using Gaia second data release. These are KIC 9716483, KIC 9716843. KIC 9716615, KIC 9716528, KIC 9594935. All these stars are single data scrutiny stars and they have been used to redefine and estimate the cluster properties of NGC 6811. These properties include metallicity and distance modulus and edge. Thank you for your attention. Um, so Doris is also not online, but please also um, go ahead and ask questions on the Slack channel. Our next talk is by Sriram. Uh, on understanding the barren cycle. Hello everyone. In the next three minutes, I will give a brief introduction of my master's work supervised by Moses and Matt at the South African Astronomical Observatory. This work is part of the Mia Choirs collaboration led by Moses. The Hypers catalog contains H121 cm detected galaxies in the local universe. SING is an H-alpha and R-band imaging follow-up of a subsample of hypersources. COIOS is a subsample of 15 fields from SING that contain four or more H-alpha sources in a 15 arc minute field of view. The selection criteria resulted in a catalog of local group analogs that are in the early stages of assembly. MIA COIOS is a meerkat follow-up of six COIO groups. These deepest and highest resolution observations of the groups were completed last year. The Baryon cycle is a complex phenomena that encapsulates all the ways in which gas gets perpetually processed in various gravitational potential wells. The Baryon cycle can be thought of as flow of multi-phase gas within and between three broad settings, the interstellar medium, the second galactic medium, and the extended environment. The extended environment can be the intra-group medium, intra-cluster medium, or the intergalactic medium. Environments play a crucial role in galaxy evolution. The focus of our work is the group environments, as more than 50% of galaxies in the local universe reside in groups. 
in groups while some works find increased star formation suppression events several other studies report increased star formation due to gas supply from satellite galaxies mergers and accretion from the cosmic web we study the neutral and ionized gas in galaxy groups and characterize the various galaxy interactions and processes of the Bayon cycle this can potentially offer a lot of information crucial for understanding the impact of environment in galaxy evolution here is a sneak peek into our resolved study of the Bayon cycle in groups in this group tidal interactions between the two main members is seen in both optical and adjacent to 21 cm emission with the high spatial and spectral resolution wide field of view and sensitivity of meerkat we are able to clearly characterize the signatures of interaction between group members we also detect several previously unknown sources within the extended field this illustrates the importance of resolution while characterizing interactions the non uniform shape and the large size of the atka beam smooths out a lot of crucial details and also shows spurious emission features the meerkat data clearly shows dwarf interactions complex rotation and even the absence of a significant tidal bridge between the two main spirals in the group using spectra from salt we also plan to study the chemical and kinematic properties of the members and the ionized gas phase multiphase studies of the bayon cycle in groups at different stages of assembly combined with the multivalent characterization of smaller members in the wider field of view will inform us of the gas kinematics group dynamics and subsequently the evolution of both groups and galaxies thank you for your attention please feel free to get in touch if you want the longer version um so shriram is online so if you can you can switch on your video if you can and we'll take uh questions so any questions from the audience or online Okay, I'll just ask this one question. So you mentioned that um, there were sources in the extended field. Are these sources related to um, the galaxy group or is it just sources that are interesting? Like why did you particularly mention these um, sources in the extended field? Hi, uh, thanks for that question. Uh, yeah, so these sources are part of the groups, uh, but they have not been detected yet because of their low surface brightness. um but with the wide field of view of meerkat we clearly see them uh, in the same position um so yeah they're part of the group and they are they are they are also they also take a play a big role in the bayon cycle because they merge with the big galaxies and they're falling into the big galaxies and they uh, fuel future star formation yeah very crucial okay thank you and now i uh, will move on to the next talk by timothy who's talking about erythemal uv radiation across nigeria where do we stand hi everyone good afternoon from nigeria my name is ebu timotisi and i'm going to be making a very short presentation on erythemal uv radiation across nigeria where do we stand this research was carried out by a team of scientists from nigeria and um we are from center for basic space science national space research and development agency in nigeria this is our outline for this uh, particular presentation we are not going to follow, follow that outline because of the limited time we have going to introduction we know we all know that um solar uv radiation is responsible for the synthesis of vitamin d but excessive exposure to it causes biological effects and you cannot talk about um solar uv radiation without talking about um its um, division it divided into uva uvb and uvc and we all know that um the minimal retinal dose is the minimal amount of exposure or exposure to ultraviolet radiation that can cause erythema on the skin the calculation of erythema uvr has been instrumental in the estimation of the uv index and we all know that uv uv index expresses the erythema power of the sun and from our table 1 we can see the various categories we have the low the medium the high very high and the extreme in this particular research we looked at seven states in nigeria and we studied these states across latitudes we looked at latitude 13 latitude 8 latitude 6 and latitude 4 and in this particular research we used satellite data from nasa and giovanni and during our data analysis we used matlab our results and discussion during the time of this research we observed that there was significant reduction in in erythema uvr 
from 1979 to 2020. Subsequently, when we try to, when we plotted the histogram, I mean plot of erythromal UVR abundance over the decade, we noticed that from 1999 to 2020, compared to previous years, that this particular um, decade showed high level of erythromal UVR reduction. The same thing was applied when we looked at the mean erythromal UVR across latitudes, and also when we use bus, uh, bus and whisker plot to summarize the latitudinal variations in the mean and uh, multi-year multi HMI UVR at, at each phase of the study. In conclusion, the findings of this result compared the UV index that we got uh, with, uh, with the table one of this research. And from what we got, the HMI UVR across um, these study locations range from eight to 10, which shows that we are on the very high category. The essence of this research is that we, we try to um, sensitize our people on the excess uh, on the effects of erythromal UVR radiation. And we also made some recommendations, which is in line with um, the WHO recommendations, limiting long exposure of the skin to solar UV, staying over hair sheds, with use of um, SPF products, avoiding of tanning beds. And these are our references. And thank you for listening. You can always find this paper online using the link on the screen. Thank you very much for listening. Um, so Timothy is online, um, so if you do have questions, please go ahead. Uh, there's a hand, um, you can go ahead and ask the, the speakers in. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Timothy, what's the physical reason for the fluctuations in the UV index from year to year? Are those changes in the ozone layer? Sorry, can you, can you repeat your question, sir? I'll make it there to be clear this evening. Okay. Here I come. I, my question was, what are the physical reasons for the changes in the UV index from year to year? Are those changes in the ozone layer? Yes, I think it's attributed to um, some of the changes in the ozone layer over time. <laughs> then what causes the changes in the ozone layer? <laughs> Take it a step further. Explain. So he's asking you explain what changes the ozone layer, <laughs> what causes the changes in the ozone layer. Okay, well, the area sense why we carried out this um, particular research is that we try to look at um, if the 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 amount of solar radiation that we we get, how does it affect um, Nigerians? So, but from our research and from our own findings, we noticed that the ozone layer plays an important role in the, in the amount of um, solar radiation that is being received across latitudes. So from our research, we noticed that, and the amount of, uh, the amount of solar radiation that is received um, varies across latitudes because we noticed that at higher latitudes, like latitude 13 and 8, those regions, they receive higher amount of um, solar radiation. Why are the lesser latitudes of at the six and four, those regions receive lesser amount of solar radiation. That is from what we found out from our analysis. I don't know if that answered your question. That's okay, thank you. And now we move on to the next talk, which is by Yusuf, um, about single star skylar optical turbulence profiling simulations. Sing okay. Yeah, opt and optical turbulence profiling simulation. Okay, it's repeated twice. Apologies for that. Good evening, everyone. I'm Youssef Erazoghi, PhD student at the Faculty of Science, Smlalia Marrakesh from Morocco. Today, I will present to you my works about the single star signal optical turbulence profile simulations. We start our simulation by generating a phase screen using the fast Fourier transform method. And to arrive to the analysis plan, the wave obtained result from the Fresnel diffraction, which means I multiplied it by the Fresnel propagator, then the wave crossed the SIDAR system. In this level, we will characterize the power spectrum function, which allow us to find the atmospheric parameters profile. In this slide, you see the one-dimensional section of the simulated and 
the theoretical power spectrum corresponding to the, to the altitude three uh, kilometers uh, with the same turbulent strength, the two curves has almost the same variation, a small shift figure out at the middle that due to the size of our phase screen. So in order to retrieve the atmospheric profile, we're gonna do an optimization of the, the two of these two curves uh, by using a program of minimization called active sets. Our work is mainly focused on the refractive index. You see here the simulated vertical profile, uh, half nagel value model of the refractive index and the retrieve uh, values of the refractive index by using the active set algorithm. As we can see clearly from these figures, the two curves profile are very close and the, and the reconst uh, reconstruction is well. Uh, the relative uh, error uh, difference between, uh, between the, the, the simulated and the retrieved values uh, is less than uh, 5%. Finally, we do a real data processing of the CN square uh, refractive index obtained, uh, at this, uh, obtained by the CEDAR installed in OHP, uh, Observatoire de Haute Province in, in French, using our program that we developed based on the minimization strategy, compared with the radio sounds launched at the same night of November 4 and 20. All curves shows the same valuation uh, once again, the algorithm allow us to retrieve the vertical profile uh, with uh, a very good accuracy. Thank you for your attention. Uh, so Yusuf is also not online. We will move on. But before the last two recorded talks, uh, Jonah is actually... Sorry? He's not online. <laughs> He's not online. So if there are questions, you can post them on Slack. Um, so since you know you are online, but you don't have your recording, would you be able to just uh, present within three minutes? Would you be able to share your slides? Yes. Hi. Okay. Okay, so uh, he'll be talking about the importance of the study and observation of stellar occultation occultation by near-earth asteroids so i'll just indicate when you have one minute left okay so i will try to finish in three minutes so um, this is my presentation you can see is it okay no uh, no we can't see it uh we don't see your slides not yet now, okay, now we can now we can okay so uh, this is the my talk it's talk about the importance of the study and observations of stellar occultation by near-earth asteroids uh, this is the outline uh, you know that uh, an asteroid is a small celestial body that orbits around the sun made up of rock, metals, and ice of irregular shape and whose dimensions vary from few uh, tens of meters to several hundred kilometers. There are more than one million asteroids, asteroids listed by uh, NASA Minor Planet Center on uh, March 2022. And uh, I would like to talk about special asteroids uh, they call a near Earth asteroid. It's a small solar system body whose orbit brings in, into uh, proximity with Earth. And among this uh, NEA, there's those who can come dangerously close to the Earth. They call PHA, potentially hazardous objects. So asteroids are a mine of um, information. They are very interesting because they are the remains of plants that didn't not form. They allow us to understand the birth of solar system. And uh, we have to study these special asteroids because they can uh, 
uh, how can I say, uh, uh, collide the uh, in uh, March uh, 14, 2022, there is 20, 28, uh, uh, 2,800,000 uh, and uh, 529 asteroids uh, 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 near uh, Earth objects. And this is, we can, in this uh, histogram, we can see uh, the estimated diameter and the total discovery. Uh, this is what does it mean a stellar occultation uh, in uh, in my case I, I work in this kind of uh, um, I work with uh, still uh, I how can I say stellar occultation by asteroids so uh, in my field of research I'm interested to study and observe stellar occultation by asteroids and more specifically near Earth objects this is a star in infinity and the asteroid in front of the observer, and we can sh uh, see the shadow, uh, the, uh, the asteroid shadow path in the Earth. Uh, uh, when we use this uh, method, we can uh, uh, we can uh, we can uh, obtain the the shape of the asteroid. Uh, until now, I I had only positive observation of uh, near- You have one minute. This is the uh, result. Uh, and this uh, result are in, in, uh, presented by uh, Denham and, uh, and C in, uh, in 20, uh, 2019. Uh, I also uh, generate predictions of stellar occultation by near Earth using occult uh, software. In, uh, in Argus Observatory, and uh, until now, uh, I, yes, this is the result. We we observed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven um, uh, um, uh, occultation, but all this uh, occultation was negative. Only. Uh, uh, Phyton, uh, you know, Phyton is a uh, uh, near Earth object, and uh, there is a, a spacecraft to uh, will observe this special asteroid. Um, summary. Okay, your time is up. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much for uh, your attention. Okay. Yeah, three minutes is quite a short time. Yes. <laughs> but uh, for it's those who who do have, <laughs> what's the problem? So for those who do have questions, I think you can just take them to Slack and um, engage um, the speaker there. So yes. now we have um, our last two speakers who also happened to be the 2021 FS um, Early Career Research Grant recipients. So congratulations to them. And we'll just play their recorded videos. Um, it's Ndiavala David, who's talking about modeling globular clusters as multi-wavelength emitters. Hello, everybody. My name is Sandelen Davids, and I'll be talking about broadband spectral modeling of the Galactic Globular Cluster for Seven Tukani. I've been working on this since last year, July. The Globular Cluster for Seven Tuck is one of the most massive clusters in our galaxy and is exceptionally rich in exotic stellar populations. It has been a favorite target of observers, and yet it is challenging to model due to its large number of stars and also higher density. Um, but seven Tuck was also the first globular cluster to be detected by Fermi LAT, and 27 millisecond pulsars have been identified in this cluster with more to be discovered since it has been estimated to harbor more than 30 um, millisecond pulsars. And of course, its gamma ray emission has been widely attributed to the millisecond pulsars. 
A seven tag has been also observed in radio to gamma rays, and thus we refer to it as a multi-wavelength object. So in this work, or in our work, we use two models uh, to fit multi-wavelength uh, data of a seven tag. Uh, one of the models is by uh, COP et al. 2013, which is a multi-zone steady state spherical symmetric model. And the model assumes pulsars, which are located basically at the center of the cluster to be responsible or to be the sources of relativistic electrons. And also um, the, our model calculates uh, the particle transport, uh, including uh, division and radiation uh, losses. The other model is by Harding and Krapakarakos, uh, 2015, and it's a model of pulsed high energy radiation over the entire spectrum from optical to very high energy gamma ray wavelength. And the model assumed that uh, the pairs that actually radiate the singleton radiation in the outer magnetosphere uh, originates from the uh, polar cap cascades, while the primary particles that radiate curvature radiation are accelerated by an electric field which is induced by rotation of the magnetic field. So for our results, here we are trying to fit the two models to the X-ray data, gamma ray data, and of course to the Hess upper limits. Um, so from the plot, we are treating the X-ray data for now as an upper limit for the green component, which is the low energy SR component. And then thus we have to invoke a new component, which is the high energy SR component, so that we can explain the X-ray data. Uh, and of course, since the green um, components also cannot reproduce uh, the, uh, the slope of the X-ray data, that's one of the reasons why we have to use a new component which is HESR. Uh, so here we are also trying to uh, find a uh, sample parameter so that the predicted low energy SR uh, is not in conflict with the X-ray data or basically the upper limit. And also while trying at the same time making uh, to make sure that uh, the inverse Compton, the, the inverse uh, component is not also in conflict with the Hess upper limit. And also at the same time, we're also trying to fit again the Chandra X-ray data and of course the Fermi gamma ray data. And so the next step is basically to look at the problem radio data and uh, of spot seven tag. Uh, so we can basically fit uh, the data with the COP model that is uh, basically the green uh, component, the low energy SR component. And we also plan to start working on a model for the stellar population of the cluster, where we have to consider stars of different masses and surface temperature. Since um, in the COP model, they have um, assumed that all stars um, have um, have the have same surface temperature of about 500 Kelvin. So here we are trying um, to assume that they have different surface temperature and they are also, uh, and that the pulses are also not uh, really um, concentrated at the center or injected at the center, but rather they are just within the cluster uh, at different positions. So that's basically it and I thank you. So she is online. Uh, if you have questions, please go ahead. Just a quick question. Okay, if not, uh, just to catch up, we'll move on to the last talk of the session, which is by Ambrose talking about accretion flow and mass accretion rates of fluctuations in a black hole candidate. Good day, everyone. My name is Eze Ambrose. I work with Gofroko University as a lecturer. I am also a PhD student at the University of Nigeria, Suka. I am one of the beneficiary of uh, our 2021 Sweet Research Grant. My research topic is accretion flow and mass accretion rates slash fluctuations in the black hole candidate mass J1535571 or time scale. The principal investigator of this research is Professor RNC at the University of Nigeria. Uh, this is the outline. Introduction. Black 
whole X-ray binaries is transferred into high mass X-ray binaries and low mass X-ray binaries. Typically for low mass X-ray binaries, uh, uh, gravitation and uh, magnetic processes necessitate uh, accretion. Of course, we know that accretion is a source of energy. The black hole accretes material from the donor star and uh, magnetic process uh, uh, collimates the accreted material onto the black hole, uh, resulting in what is called accretion disk. A subsequent accretion onto the black hole results to what is called instability. And a rapid instability in the accretion disk leads to what is called outburst. Outburst is a dramatic destruction of the accretion uh, disk which lead to ejection of energetic particles in the form of accretion flow and jets. Uh, the source I am working on, the outburst happened on September 2nd, 2017. And the research have shown uh, that um, the air flow matter from the site of astrophysical event contains optically thick geometrical thin plasma, which is responsible for multicolor black body component radiation. And um, optically, Thin geometrical thick plasma, which is uh, responsible for hard S rays. Of course, uh, these hard flow matters uh, dominate one another and also coexist. Uh, and their contribution on the accretion flow determines the spectral state of the source. Literature have also revealed that um, the source has been uh, different spectral states the hard states, the hard intermediate states, soft intermediate states, and soft states. Of course, the crystal state is the state of the source when adverse have not uh, happened. And um, investigation have shown that um, the spectral state of or spectral evolution of a black hole candidate depends on the spectral parameters, such as temperature, transition radius, luminosity, mass accretion rate, spectral photon index, and hysterical structure uh, characteristics. Of course, among these uh, properties or uh, parameters, mass accretion rate seems to be the hidden property in the accretion flow. In the sense that um, the S3 flux variability of the source is strongly linked to the mass accretion rate. So this study is uh, uh, focused on um, studying the accretion flow and tracking the uh, evolution of the mass accretion rate during the outburst of the source. Um, depends on the spectral parameter one wants to constrain, uh, that guides the so, uh, person on the model to use and uh, applicable model to use is the convolution multiplicative and additive model. Of course, um, equation one give us the temperature, equation two uh, give us the, uh, can constrain the radius from the, using equation two. Um, question three is also temperature. Then equation four is the mass accretion rates of the inner region of the accretion flow. Question five and six is the luminosity. Uh, eight and nine is also temperature and luminosity. Question 10 is the uh, accretion rate, mass accretion rate of the sub Keplerian outflow of the matter. So using a combination of the model, addictive, uh, multiplicative and conv convolution model, someone can constrain the spectral uh, uh, fit parameters, which can be used to estimate the physical uh, uh, parameters. Of course, uh, modeling the source with a bulk motion computerization model will also give us uh, a normalization parameter and the spectral photon index. Of course, a plot of uh, spectral photon index and against the uh, normalization parameter, uh, give us the correlation of the mass accretion rate evolution uh, during uh, uh, the outburst of the source. Then uh, data reduction and analysis, uh, we use the HISOFT high energy astrophysical software, another applicable software uh, of the satellites uh, we collected the data from in doing the data reduction and analysis. Uh, we uh, were able to uh, model the source uh, spectrum, the S-ray source spectrum of the source uh, using a, a combination of models. 
and uh, in order to constrain the spectral fit parameter. Uh, this is the light curve of the source starting from the uh, The speaker did go over the three minutes, and to be fair, we'll stop it there. And we have reached the end of our session. I don't think the speaker is online. Um, so um, let's thank all the speakers for the session.